This is Come Follow Me Insights from Book of Mormon Central. Today, Alma 36 to 38. And we've brought our friend on, Jack Welch. He is the founder of Book of Mormon Central and the discoverer of a beautiful literary pattern in the Book of Mormon called chiasmus. And we're delighted today to have him talk about that discovery and why it matters. So, Jack, to begin with, many people in the world are familiar with the term chiasmus. But there are many of our, of our audience who maybe have never even seen this word or have any idea what it means. What would you, what would you, how would you describe that? Well, join the crowd. Uh, it is a term that uh, wasn't very widely known uh, and still isn't in many circles, but biblical scholars and people who work a lot in ancient literature are familiar with this because it's a kind of rhetorical way of saying things that is made necessary because of some of the aspects of their writing. For example, they had no paragraphs. Uh, They had no periods or commas. They don't use the ways that we do to signal to readers when one idea is beginning and ending and the next idea beginning and ending. And so they used parallelism and this kind of chiasm to create a unit structure so that you can tell when you've started something You go through a list of items and then go through that list in the opposite order, and when you get to the end, you know you've finished. And it was widely used not only in written texts, uh, but the written texts are based on oral tradition. And the use of this kind of, of organizational way of thinking is especially helpful in oral literature, and most of the ancient world communicated verbally. And so this kind of style is not particularly comfortable to us, but when we see it, it becomes really clear. Beautiful. So where did we even get the name? Uh, The word chiasmus in Greek uh, means a crisscrossing. It can also mean coming to a crux, a crossroads. And chiasmus will often be used to help emphasize in a literary way a turning point where someone in their life has come to a crossing. And it can also be used in a way to represent what we call an antithetical parallelism, where you're having a contrast. The first half of the parallelism gives a positive idea, and then the next is a negative idea to help emphasize the, uh, uh, you know, what something isn't, is just as important to us understanding it as knowing what it is. This is a part of wisdom literature to help see, like the, uh, the doctrine of the two ways. There's the right way and the wrong way, and chiasmus will often show up in passages that are talking about that. So what you're saying is it's, it's kind of, in, in some ways, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of benefits from this chiastic structure, but in some ways it's an X marks the spot bringing people to a point, almost, almost like this part of the, the diagram to say, look, here are all of these aspects, here's a turning point, here are all of these aspects. And Correct. Beautiful. Where in the world did you discover this? In the Book of Mormon? Well, in the world, I was in Regensburg, Germany, and I was a missionary, and it was uh, in Regensburg, which... Uh, was a center of German Catholicism and lots of uh, Catholic bookstores and educated people. And it was, as the story has been told many times, I noticed on a bulletin board uh, a uh, a lecture schedule for some lectures that were going to be given that summer, and one of them was on uh, a series on the New Testament. And my companion and I decided this would be a good way to spend our diversion day or our P-day And the one lecture that we happened to go to, the professor had just read a book about chiasmus in the Gospel of Matthew. And it was there that I first heard the word. And uh, a couple weeks later, after uh, following up on that professor's footnotes and reading and buying some literature on that, uh, that the uh, uh, discovery of chiasmus in Mosiah chapter 5, verses 10 to 12, was the, uh, the first chiasm that was found in the Book of Mormon. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the day you discovered chiasmus was the center point of your mission. That's correct. Uh, 
Uh, it was on August 16th, 1967, and it was the exact halfway point of my mission. So it was the, it marked the spot. X marks the spot. What a great Good. day to find Good. that. So Jack, um, give, give us a couple of examples of chiasmus, of what it actually looks like on the scripture page. Well, maybe the best place to start is the first one I found, which is in uh, Mosiah chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. That early morning when I first found that, I was prompted to simply begin reading where we'd left off the night before as we read our Book of Mormon before we went to bed. It was uh, in Mosiah chapter 4 that I started reading, and Mosiah chapter 5 was not far behind. Mm -hmm. But the center point of that's a good example of that, because it's right here that says, I, I would that you should remember also that this is the name I said I would give unto you that never should be blotted out, except it be through transgression. Therefore, and that's the turning point, take heed that you do not transgress, that the name be not blotted out of your hearts. You would put transgression and be careful that you don't transgress. Why? So that it would blot out not the be name, blotted out. not be blotted out, because he's telling will us be blotted out. it will be. Yeah. So that's how you discovered it. Right. And uh, there's another thing that was immediately reinforcing to me on this, and that is that if you don't remember the name, you will be found on the left hand of God, and that was up here. And if your name is blotted out, you will not be found on the left hand of God. Now, this seems like a lot of double talk to us, and you'd think that, you know, Benjamin could have been a lot simpler in making the point, but the fact is that he wanted to focus at this point on the covenant-making importance of keeping that covenant that they've made and not transgress. And what chiasmus allows you to do is really zero in on the crucial turning point, the crux, the cross. And here it's don't transgress. And sometimes when you see two things that are rather unusual, for example, left hand of God and left hand of God, the only two places in the whole Book of Mormon that the left hand of God are mentioned are right here in these verses. And so that uniqueness tends to enhance our confidence that the uh, passage was intentional. So, Jack, let's jump into, <clears throat> into Alma 36 specifically because – well, let me just ask you, how would you classify Alma 36 in the realm of chiasmus in the Book of Mormon? <laughs> well, well, I've written an article called uh, Alma 36, The Masterpiece. It, 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 is. it really is. When you compare all of the thousands of places in the ancient world where you have chiastic structures, this is the best. It's most, the most purposeful. It is the, the most precise. It can be analyzed at the word level, at the concept level, but most of all, at the, the spiritual use of this technique, of this literary structure, to let us know exactly what it was that was the turning point of Alma's life. Beautiful. Okay, let's dive in. Let's have some fun with this. So we'll just use this basic structure to begin. So should we start here with Alma 36? Absolutely. That's, that's, uh, would you, that's the turning would point. Would you say that this turning point of Alma 36 um, is actually the turning point for you and for me and for you and for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the church of Jesus Christ? That is the turning point. It is the answer. In Alma's struggling with the inexpressible horror that he finally realized that he was living with and that he would become banished and extinct and harrowed up, he says, to the greatest degree, the one thing that he, his mind finally caught upon was remembering that his father had spoken about the coming of one Jesus Christ, a son of God. And he cried out within his soul, Oh Jesus, have mercy on me, who am in the gall of bitterness. And that is the pivot point. 
It's the turning point of his life. Interestingly, in Hebrew, uh, the word to repent is to turn. Mm -hmm. Lots of times the scriptures will say, turn, turn, turn. And well, he, he turned a corner, didn't he? Yeah, and so it is, it's, we, we think of it as repentance, but the word repent actually comes from the uh, uh, Latin roots, uh, which have more to do with rethinking than actually turning. But for the Hebrew world, repentance is turning, turning away from what you shouldn't and turning to God. And chiasmus, there couldn't be a better literary structure than chiasmus to make that point. So now if we go into actual verses in Alma 36, uh, the, that turning point occurs at the end of um, 17 and the beginning of 18 which, if you look very carefully, everything leading into that turning point, everything, is his old life of sin. It's miserable. He's describing – Jack, you've used words like harrowed up, wish that I could be banished. He, he just didn't even want to exist anymore. That's right. The realization of what he had done was terrible. And, and yet, once he has been converted, he then will say, yea, my joy was as exceeding as had been my pain. It's almost like he's saying, I know there will be people out there who won't understand chiasmus, so I'm going to make it perfectly clear. <laughs> <laughs> you and, can't miss it. And so the contrast yes. is, uh, you know, he says, yes, I was in deep, deep trouble, but now all of that has been fixed. So, Jack, would it be safe to say that verse 1 through 17 for, for those who are watching, they could, they could open up Alma 36 and read verse 1 through 17 and mark every instance of all of the – it's all the bad. This is all of his life of sin. In essence, you could summarize verse 1 through 17 with one word. This is what it feels like to, to – these are the pains of a damned soul. He's describing hell here. Yeah, that's kind of what we, we tend to emphasize. But if you begin, there's a prologue, and the prologue is a positive one. It says, my son, give ear to my words. That's the first thing you do. You have to, you have to listen to the words and give strict heed to the commandments of God. Now, he will end by also mentioning the commandments of God, and he will then say at the very end, and this is according to his words. What he's done there is he begins by giving ear to my words, but at the end, you are now prepared to give heed to God's words. You can see the, the shift. So there's a, there's a progression there. The, the hell and the, the joy, or the pain and the joy, you know, when he's in the very depths of his three days of being racked with – Yeah. And then – he wants to make sure that we understand – this, this can't just be one word, it has to be a whole set of feelings, and that's why he said it was as exceeding as was my pain, because it's got all of these features in it as well. So as a person analyzes this, think about all of the ways in which an unrepented sin will, will lead your life into a pain and suffering and spiritual a regret and remorse and all of the things that sin does to you. And then now think of all of the things that conversion will do to you. And that's kind of this, this block of things. In this area, the, the chiasm doesn't, doesn't work out as, what would we say, as meticulously as in the early part. Right. And but there are different rhetorical devices being used in each of these cases that are comparable in the, uh, the heaven and hell comparison. One of them, for example, is where he said uh, that uh, you know, he did not want to go into the presence of God. He wanted to be banished and extinct. He just couldn't yeah. stand the thought. He just didn't want to exist anymore. But then how does he explain the joy? He now says, yea, my joy was as exceeding as was my pain, and and I thought I saw, even as my father, our father Lehi saw, God surrounded 
sitting on his throne, surrounded by numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Now, what he's doing there is quoting uh, a whole block of text from 1 Nephi chapter 1 to say how much he now wants to be like Lehi, brought into the heavenly presence and into the council of all those glorious beings. So, in other words, the, the contrast here is, is uh, elaborate, uh, and there are some other things going on than just the, uh, the direct inversion. But then he talks about, here, my limbs had been, uh, had been paralyzed. Right. What he means by that is my, my hands and my feet, I couldn't move. My body couldn't move, but my spirit, my spirit was, was still moving. moving. And I think that's a really important contrast because down here he then will talk about, I received now my limbs back again. What can I do now with my body to now live the life of righteousness? Here he had been destroying this, the church. Down here he will now build the church. And uh, he's been born of God here. He mentions being born of God down here again. There are plenty of places where people can see all of these things detailed but every one of them is worthy of, of contemplation. You know, the first part of Alma 36 is, is a roadmap of the process of repentance. How do you repent? Well, you begin by giving ear to the words of the prophet. You, you go through the, you know, the repentance process step by step. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the repentance process is not just uh, deciding we're going to be different. It's where our heart is changed. And that change comes through uh, the atonement of Jesus Christ. And without that, you haven't reached the, the, real, uh, the real essence of, of this repentance. And who knows this better than Alma? He's been through it. And he loved to tell this story. He refers to it in almost every one of his speeches. There's an allusion to it in one way or another. So here in Alma chapter 36, he's bringing all those pieces together. And what he's doing is giving his son Helaman the master version of his conversion story. It wasn't appropriate in some circumstances for him to go into this kind of depth uh, and talking to other audiences. Uh, but behind all of Alma's speeches stands this one experience. And Alma 36 then brings that all together. Here again, the Book of Mormon surprises us again, does it again with another fact that, you know, how do you explain the presence of something like this in the Book of Mormon when so little was known about this in Joseph Smith's day? And and even if Joseph Smith had known everything we know about it today, you still have then the chore of somehow composing these complicated structures as you dictate with no notes. Uh, it's staggering. And how does it happen? Well, as Joseph said over and over again, it was by the gift and power of God. And I love to think about that because it is, first of all, a gift. This is something that was given to us. It was given to me. I didn't go looking for this sort of thing. This is not me figuring this out. Uh, this is something that was a gift given to me that I might do something with it, as all gifts are given to us. When we're given a gift, it's not for our pleasure or amusement. It's so that we then can take that talent and do something with it. It was by the gift of God. And Joseph Smith then knew that his mission was to do a lot with the Book of Mormon, and he fulfilled that mission. We also have this gift placed in our hands. And, and we know it's a gift because we can see that it came by the power of God. And it wasn't just the, the power in the sense of the mechanistic doing of this, but it's the power that it contains, the way in which it can touch souls 
the way it can actually rivet into your being, mm -hmm. these principles that aren't just being stated casually but forcefully, so that the Spirit can testify to us, as it has to me, the truthfulness of these words that are being not just said and not just communicated, but represented in the sense that they represent to us eternal truths that otherwise remain obscure and inaccessible to us. Would you also say it would be accurate to uh, couch it this way that the Book of Mormon is such an amazing gift brought forth by the gift and power of God that it's layered in such a way that if somebody goes their entire life without learning about any ancient literary techniques, they're still going to benefit powerfully from the book, but the more you learn about the breadth and the depth of this incredible book and its people and the processes that they, that they went through to even get the book into our hands today all the way down through Joseph Smith, then it just takes our testimony and our appreciation for not just the book, but the central feature of the book, it just takes it to whole new levels of appreciation and of understanding and of, of joy, allowing us to repent in the, in the Hebrew sense, allowing us to turn our hearts and our lives to God. Precisely. This conversation isn't as much about chiasmus as it is about taking our study of the Word of God maybe a little more seriously. Than we have before. And chiasmus is one avenue, that the mm -hmm. one fruit that will come from that effort. It, to me, it reminds me of my favorite quote about the book itself from, from President Benson when he said, there is a power in the book that will begin to flow into your life the moment you begin a serious study. Serious study, not a blind reading or a surface quote book approach, but a serious study, if we take this seriously, we will feel that power flow into our life immediately, he says. Yeah, yeah. And you do. You take it seriously when you say, this is real. This is reality. Uh, this is not wishful thinking or fiction. This is not historical fiction. This is and, not a nice quote book. And the scriptures will even say, and is that not real? And that's the question we're all asked to, uh, to come to God with. Um, Moroni, you know, he begins, we often don't start with Moroni chapter 10, verse 3. We start with verse 4. But you've got to read verse 3, too, because he says, when you receive these things, oh, you have to first receive them, and that doesn't just mean get a copy, but you receive it as you welcome it into your life, as you receive these things and as you remember the mercies that have been shown to you by God and allowing you to have these things. And that's what Alma starts with. Remember the deliverance of your, your people. He's giving you here also a model for how you can be born of God and get that testimony. And so, after doing those kinds of things, then, if you will ask, <clears throat> with a sincere heart, having faith in God, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, that's, again, taking it uh, seriously. Yeah, it denotes a process of serious immersion and, and conversion rather than just a drive-through window event. And Tyler, let me say one more thing about how you are blessed with these kinds of insights. Uh, when I find things that I find most valuable in my life, it's when I am actually looking for something else. Mm. When I am working on an assignment or fulfilling a calling and then recognize that the Lord has blessed me, by giving me something that I would not have thought of before so that I could then go and use it. And I've mentioned how that happened a little bit with the uh, Mosiah 5 discovery, but that's how it happened with Alma 36 as well. I hadn't noticed Alma 36 
until I'd been home from my mission for about six months. And I'd been called to be the Sunday school gospel doctrine teacher in my student ward. And our elders quorum had decided that we would go to the Manti Temple on Saturday, March the 8th. And uh, I went with them, wanting to be a good member of the quorum, but also knowing that I needed to have the strength of the temple if I was going to be a good teacher. The lesson that I gave on Sunday morning right after we got back from the Manti Temple, and I recorded in a letter that I wrote home on Sunday night, on March the 9th, that the lesson was on Alma the Younger. And what we had decided to do as a class was to try to put together uh, a character sketch of Alma the Younger. What was he like? Did he get mad? You know, what are his skills? How was he like us or different? But what can we discern from his words about what kind of, what it would be like to meet him in person? So I was reading through a lot of Alma material, not looking for chiasmus, but trying to understand Alma. And in my letter home that Sunday night, I explained going to the temple and how I was very happy that I had gone and felt that I had received direction in some decisions I was making in my life. And then, after telling about the Sunday school class going very well, I said, oh, and also, I just found a gorgeous pattern in Alma 36, period. It was late, that's all I said. But why did I see this? I mean, I was reading in this uh, reprint of the uh, first edition of the Book of Mormon. I like to do that, but you can see here my pencil notations in the margin going down uh, the elements in Alma 36 that I wrote that very day as I was reading through this, looking for something else only to be overwhelmed with the recognition of the turning point, with the marking there on the top of page 325, and basically these elements would then become the initial presentation of the chiastic structure of Alma 36 in the BYU Studies article. That presentation has been refined by myself and other people over the years, but here it was. And it, I won't say it just fell in my lap, but it certainly knocked me over. And it was just, what could I say? But this is just great. Now, my point is, we, we have to be humble in this process. And we realize that the Lord will make these things available if he can trust us to use these things to bless other people. And I hope that's what we've been able to do with our work. I know you have done with yours, what we're trying to do here at Book of Mormon Central. And isn't that why these little gems, big gems, treasures, this is maybe the best example of chiasmus anywhere in world literature. And it's best not just because of its rigorous structure, but because of the message that it so clearly communicates. It's wonderful. Now as we, as we turn over from chapter 36 into the second half of Alma's teaching to his son Helaman, there are some really profound truths that come out of this chapter. This is where Helaman is going to be the next prophet, the next high priest, and there are a whole bunch of things that go with that office. And so Alma, the younger, is going to take significant time here to introduce his son to each of these elements that, that he is now going to be in charge of taking, taking care of and passing down through the generations. Uh, if you look at chapter 37, verse 6, to me, and this is just my, my personal opinion here, that verse 6 is the thesis statement for the entirety of what is going on 
in the rest of chapter 37. You'll notice he says, now you may suppose that this is foolishness in me, but behold, I say unto you that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. And small means in many instances doth confound the wise. So if you look carefully at chapter 37, you're going to see a whole list of things that could be considered, especially by the world, as small and simple and not very important. Uh, take a moment of reflection and think back on your life to some of the turning points in your life where you made some decisions or you, you turned and went a different direction with your life. What was it that caused that turn? Now, this may not be the case for all of you, but often it's small and simple things that come along. Somebody will say something or do something or a door will open up and it seems small and insignificant. You walk through that door and next thing you know, your whole future has been changed uh, and it's pretty profound. Years ago, just as a, a little illustration of this, when I was teaching institute up in Logan, at the institute next to Utah State University, I had 100% job satisfaction. I loved teaching at the institute. I loved my colleagues. I loved the students. I loved what I was doing, uh, working with developing an online seminary program and working with some pre-service students, preparing them to be seminary teachers. I loved everything about my job and I had zero intention of ever leaving the seminary and institute program. One day, two teachers from uh, Brigham Young University, Frank Judd and David Whitchurch were in the building observing some teachers and uh, Wayne Dimmock, the institute director, came and told me that they were going to be in my class and I said, Wayne, I have zero interest in teaching at BYU. I am not leaving SNI. And he said, well, just be kind to them. I said, well, I can do that. After the uh, lesson, I'll never forget this moment. I can still see in my mind's eye in my office there in the Institute in Logan, David Whitchurch and Frank Judd sitting across from me, and I was being very kind and very friendly with zero interest in leaving the Institute. And David asked, so Tyler, would you ever have any interest in teaching at BYU, potentially? They weren't offering a job, they couldn't do that, they were just out searching for potential candidates. And I smiled and I opened my mouth to say very kindly, thank you, but I, I really have no interest, and I mean zero interest in teaching at BYU, which would mean I would have to leave the institute program. And it was in that moment, my mouth was open, I was ready to say I have no interest when four words came very forcefully into my mind. Uh, with an exclamation mark attached, and the four words were, don't close any doors. And it came in command form in an instant, and remember my mouth was open. I paused and said, ah, uh, I've never really seriously considered it before, at which point I'm thinking, what are you doing to me? I couldn't figure out what was happening. Brothers and sisters, it was a very small, very small, very simple thing that occurred in that instant that I didn't close the door, and one thing led to another, led to another, led to another, and next thing you know, we're teaching at BYU, and other opportunities for me to learn and grow and develop and do things had now opened up, but I, I didn't even know what to ask for before that point. Small and simple means is at many times how God carries forth his work. Now watch as we go through chapter 37. Just look at this list for a minute. You get in verse uh, 2, he, he describes the plates of Nephi that you're now going to be in charge of, Helaman. Small and simple to the world, wow, great things brought to pass. He then goes to verse 3, the plates of brass. You're going to be in charge of taking care of those, small and simple, great things brought to pass. You'll notice then in verse 8, he says, Now it has hitherto been wisdom in God that these things should be preserved, for behold, they have 
enlarge the memory of this people. These plates, these scriptures have been preserved because they enlarge the memory of this people. Small things, great things brought to pass, because if you enlarge the memory of the people, you're going to increase their ability to, to have these moments where they repent, where they turn away from sin, away from, from the flesh and the natural man, and turn towards God and the things of, of the covenant path. Look at verse 11. This is a small and simple way to handle really big doctrinal questions that we don't yet have revealed. Notice he says, now these mysteries are not yet fully made known unto me, therefore I shall forbear. Kind of a fun approach to say, it's not been revealed, so I'm going to forbear, because sometimes, brothers and sisters, we get so caught up in the deep and, and eternal mysteries when we really don't know. It's kind of like uh, kindergartners sitting on the playground talking about principles of quantum physics just because we learned how to count to ten. There are some things that are revealed and there are others that aren't, and it, quite frankly it doesn't do us much good to spend a ton of time in our classes uh, hypothesizing or, or guessing about things that we really don't know. So Alma shows us a beautiful pattern here. I'm, I'm going to forbear. I don't know. And it's okay to not know. In fact, sometimes it's more dangerous to act like we do know. When we don't know, we can actually do more damage that way. Look at verse 13. Oh, remember, remember, my son, Helaman, how strict are the commandments of God. If you circle commandments, that is a small and simple thing whereby great things are brought to pass. Look at verse 16. If ye keep the commandments of God and do with these things which are sacred according to that which the Lord doth command you, for you must appeal unto the Lord for all things whatsoever you must do with them. Now check this out. Behold, no power, no power on earth or hell can take them from you, for God is powerful to the fulfilling of all his words. Small and simple diligence and obedience will bring about the great power of God to help us fulfill things. Now, in Helaman's realm, that was, you do your best to take care of these plates and no power of earth or hell can take them away from you. But for us, it's we do the things that we're asked to do on the covenant path and no power of earth and hell can remove that faith, that testimony from us, that conversion uh, process from us. It's pretty profound. Now go to verse 21. Now I will speak unto you concerning these twenty-four plates. So we get the plates, the record of the, the Jaredites. Small and simple things take care of them. The very ending of verse 21, preserve these interpreters. The, the interpreters that God gave, small and simple things that bring great things to light. Look at verse 32. Uh, through 35, 36, 37, he's talking about these small and simple elements of the gospel, repentance, being humble, meek, lowly of heart, remembering to, to gain wisdom, to cry unto the Lord. Prayer is a small and simple thing which brings to pass great blessings from heaven. Then in 38 he talks about the, the ball or director, or our fathers called it liahona which is being interpreted a compass. By the way, little trivia here, that's the only place in the entire Book of Mormon, 531 pages in English, where you get the name Leahona. Everywhere else it's just referred to as the ball or the director or the compass. Here is where Alma the Younger actually gives it its name, the Leahona. Small, simple, intricate, not, not, it can't be replicated by man and yet because of that little small gift from God, it led them through the wilderness. Now look at verse 41. As you analyze as an individual, as a couple, as a family, whatever setting you're in, as you analyze the small and simple things in your life that are like a liahona, that give incredible direction to guide you in the more fertile parts of the wilderness, look at verse 40, uh, 41. Nevertheless, because those miracles were worked by small means, it did show unto them marvelous works. 
they were slothful and forgot to exercise their faith and diligence, and then those marvelous works ceased and they did not progress in their journey. Sometimes we look for the big, the fantastic, the, the miraculous in order to then follow and be diligent and obedient. It's the idea of if God commanded you and your family to build a boat or an ark, most of us would probably say, wonderful, let's go do it, and we would, we would work at it. But if he says, love your family, love your neighbor, uh, minister to the needs of those around you, sometimes it's so small and it seems so insignificant that maybe we don't give as much diligent heed to those commands as we do to the big, huge commands or the big callings in the church versus the little callings that seem so small and simple, and yet it's often in those callings where lives are totally changed because of a, a moment here, an experience here, or a pattern throughout that process of working with people and ministering with people, and I know of nothing more uh, applicable to this principle than what happens in the home, what happens with families. It's not big, huge family vacations that create that covenant culture as much as it is daily discipleship, daily striving to be good and to teach the correct principles, not just with our words but with our actions, and when we see each other struggling and then repenting and granting forgiveness to each other and moving forward collectively as a group, great things are brought to pass. That, in my mind, is where, where lives are really changed in the most deeply profound ways. Let's uh, finish this concept in chapter 37 with verse 44. For behold, it is, as e it is as easy to give heed to the word of Christ, which will point to you a straight course to eternal bliss, as it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass, which would point unto them a straight course to the promised land. You'll notice if you look back a few verses that uh, there were many times when they didn't give diligent heed to that compass, and so they wandered, and Alma tells Helaman here that they spent eight years wandering because they didn't take a direct course because they didn't give heed to the words and to the direction given on the Liahona. Now, when Alma finished with his uh, with his son Helaman, he then turns his attention to Shiblon. Shiblon is, is a remarkable son, but we only get one chapter for him. As Jack pointed out earlier, the first part of chapter 38 from verse 1 down through 8 is kind of Alma summing up his story, the full chiastic version of his story that he gave to Helaman, he's giving kind of the highlights to Shiblon. He's not giving him the full story in its, in its um, entire detail. And then once he gets to verse 9, notice he shifts and he says, Now, my son, I have told you this that you may learn wisdom. Let's now talk a bit about something called wisdom literature. Alma 38 could be described as wisdom literature. Now, this phrase is very uh, specific around certain types of literature that show up in Scripture. I'll write this word down. For example, the book of Proverbs. That is wisdom literature. And I want to remind everybody this word wisdom is pretty amazing because other words that we are all familiar with actually come from the same word, like, like wit and idea. Uh, even the word history, which actually means inquiry. Even our word vision and evidence all have to do with seeing. 
The basic concept of the word wisdom has to do with seeing. And all these words here are about seeing things. Now, so the book of Proverbs is literature where a righteous father is teaching righteous instruction to his son. And a righteous son will listen to the beautiful, righteous words of his father, preserve them, and then teach them to his children. Now, of course, the real father we should be listening to is God the Father. But in wisdom literature, uh, a human father in some ways represents God the Father, who delivers loving, covenantal instructions and commandments for how to live well. And if we look at Alma 38, who is the wise father? It's Alma the younger, and he's teaching wise commandments to his son Shiblon. And what's really interesting is if you look throughout the Book of Mormon record, in fact, in some ways, the Book of Mormon record itself is wisdom literature. It begins with Lehi, this righteous father, teaching the wise words to his son Nephi. And how do you know who the righteous are? It is those who are willing to listen and preserve the wise words of the father, as well as a righteous father on earth. And what does Nephi do? He listens to the wise words of his father Lehi, who happens to be learning from God the Father, and he shares that with his children. Laman and Lemuel, they don't listen. They are not wise. They're actually fools. And if you look at the Book of Mormon record, it actually is a series of fathers teaching covenantal instructions or words of wisdom to their sons who preserve that and teach it to others. In fact, we have this interesting pattern. After Abinadi teaches, Alma the Elder is converted. He had listened to the wise words of Abinadi. And then he passed those down to his son, Alma the Younger, who then taught those wise words to Helaman. And Helaman listened to those wise words and became a wise person by also teaching and preserving and transmitting those records to his son Helaman and so forth to then his son Nephi. And Nephi had a son named Nephi who had a son named Nephi. And then actually this last Nephi had two sons and one of them actually passed the records down to Mormon. So here from Abinadi to Mormon is almost an unbroken chain of wisdom literature of God the Father delivering the wisdom of how to live a life of joy to fathers, to sons who listened to their wise fathers and preserved those words for themselves and for others and passed that tradition down all the way until now, we have these wise words available for us today. And so the question is, will we become wise parents? Will we preserve these wise words and deliver them to our children? Will we teach these wise words to our children? Will we model these wise words to our children? And most importantly, will we help our children turn to the real wise father who can always deliver wisdom, and ultimately joy and salvation. When the scriptures jump into this wisdom literature, it's beautiful. It, it becomes kind of – it reads more like the Proverbs, where it's a word to the wise. The, the truly wise people will pay attention to this. Learn wisdom here. So look at some of the things he says. There is no other way or means whereby man can be saved only in and through Christ. Behold, he is the life and the light of the world. Behold, he is the word of truth and righteousness. Uh, there's no that, If you want to be wise, learn that lesson first among all the other lessons. No other way to be saved, only in, through, in and through Christ. Now look at verse 10. And now as you've begun to teach the word, even so I would that you should continue to teach, and I would that you would be diligent and temperate in all things. You're starting to sense something, this father talking to his son Shiblon, he's noticed some things in his son's uh, character 
um, and he's addressing those and teaching him wisdom. Look at verse 11, see that you are not lifted up unto pride, see that you do not boast in your own wisdom nor of your much strength. In other words, Shiblon's a pretty smart guy, he's pretty strong, he's pretty effective as a missionary. They're, they're on this mission, right, among the Zoramites when this, is, this story is being inserted. Look at verse 12, use boldness but not overbearance. Maybe Alma has observed this son get a little too uh, overbearing at times in his teaching, in his uh, interactions with people. And then this uh, wise counsel, also see that ye bridle all your passions that ye may be filled with love. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that looks at the word passion and instantaneously attaches to that all of the, the physical aspects of passion. But you'll notice Alma's words here to human were, bridle all your passions. Not all passions are, are physical or sexual in nature. Some of our passions might have to do with things like art or sports or culture or politics or travel or entertainment or video games or reading or Netflix or whatever, there are a lot of things that human beings can become passionate about. And I love the fact that Alma told his son, see that ye bridle all your passions, not just the physical kind, bridle all of them. Notice that he didn't say kill all of your passions, he didn't say squelch, crush, beat down all of your passions, he said bridle all of your passions, which means you're holding the reins, you're calling the shots on every one of those passions, you're deciding where those passions take you, because if you don't bridle the passion, the passion grows wild and all of a sudden that wild mustang, that horse is going to take you places you never intended to go at speeds you never thought possible nor desirable. But if we can bridle those passions, those God-given desires, appetites, and passions, whatever they may be and however they've developed in your life, if you keep them in check, you control the pace, you control the direction, then they will take you places you want to go. Otherwise, they're going to take you places you never intended for them to go and you're going to lose control. And you could spend a lot of time looking at the significance of a bridle and a bit in, a, in an animal's mouth, something so small, so seemingly insignificant and simple can control something so big and so powerful. So if you or somebody that's a loved one is struggling with, with addiction or with certain passions that have, have gone wild, the question might be, how can we learn to begin to put that bridle in and begin to take a little more control today than I had yesterday? And how can I start steering it in directions that are a little more helpful today than they were taking me yesterday? And bit by bit, pun intended, work our way forward in, uh, in bridling all those passions. And notice his last counsel in verse 12, see that ye refrain from idleness. Again, this activation of agency. Don't, don't be idle, do things. And then he counsels him on some other things and then bids his son farewell as he sends him off to teach the, the word unto this people. Uh, in closing, brothers and sisters, there is a God in heaven and he sees everything past, present, and future. He knows you better than you know you. He understands the, the constraints that you're facing better than you understand them and better than I understand mine. And there will be times in your life when he will bring people or situations or settings that may seem small and simple at first in order to steer you in a certain direction or to turn your life in another, in another uh, direction, whether it be attached to sin versus righteousness or career 
or family decisions or schooling or whatever it may be, uh, my invitation to you today to finish would be don't close any doors on the Lord and on the direction that he may bring into your life. Know that he lives and know that he loves you. And we leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.